I knew that there was one person I wanted to invite to speak on this because he can speak on it with authority. He's a recovery pastor. He is in recovery. He is running an addiction treatment center. And it's my friend, and I would even say my mentor, one of my mentors, Pastor Adam Comer. He serves as the chief executive officer at S2L Recovery, which is also the place he found freedom from addiction a decade ago. Adam is also the executive producer and director of the Forgotten Pandemic documentary, which we will show you a preview. I think you did pick up a flyer, and we're going to get to that in a second or after this uh, talk. That recently was released about Christ-centered addiction recovery. I'm really excited about this. Please welcome Adam Comer. I chose the wrong way to walk here, so let me see. Should I just come up? Awesome. Thank you. That was a very generous introduction that I wrote for you and made you say. So. I left my phone up here. One second. Sorry. Hey, let me pray while she's wasting some of my time up here. <laughs> so let's pray. Father in heaven, God, I love you and I praise you. Lord, you are sovereign overall, including addiction. God, we know and we stand here in agreement that addiction is not a surprise to you. God, I pray that you speak through me, make little of me and more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I am a hometown Knoxville boy. I grew up here. I met my beautiful, godly wife at Bearden High School. No one's from Bearden. Okay. Okay, yes, one. Um, my, my mother taught at Farragut High School. Okay, we're on a roll. That's good. My dad coached at West Valley and Farragut and Central and... I'm out of here. Is this even Knoxville? I'll tell you this, I've been away for a decade, but I have long suffered on Saturdays with you. Long suffered on Saturdays with you. It's been a heartbreak. I've been in Middle Tennessee for almost a decade, but I'm still a Vols fan. So I am charged with speaking about addiction from a biblical point of view, a spiritual point of view. And I do that today with two points of emphasis, but one authority. Uh, the two points of emphasis would be um, I battled an addiction. There's people in the room that can tell you that, that I stole from, that I manipulated, that I lied to. So there's that, but there's also, uh, for the last decade, I've, I've served at a residential Christ-centered addiction recovery facility. I've seen thousands of men come through. I've gone back to school to study psychology, to study theology, to study religion. So those are points of interest, but the authority that I speak of and from is from this book. It's from the Word of God. Because like I said in my prayer, addiction is not a surprise to God. So let me start with this scripture. It's Ephesians 6.12. I believe it's the perfect groundbreaking for what we're going to say. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. Now, when I first read this passage, um, maybe not the first time, but when I was really studying it and trying to understand what things meant and I stopped just skipping over things, I had a problem with this passage. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And I had an issue with this. This is early on. It's because I've wrestled with flesh and blood. I've been in fistfights. I've bled. And so the Bible just must not understand what it's like to be a Christian or a person in 2021 or whatever year it was. They don't understand. The Bible's saying it's not about those things, and yet that's all that it's about to me. And I wrestled with that, and I struggled with, it, with that, and I prayed, and I, I looked at complimentary verses, and I wanted to understand how could this be. And then later on, as you know, it goes into the armor of God, and it tells us how to be equipped. And then one day I finally understood. And it was through not an audible voice of God, but through his word, he spoke to me. Adam, why were you in a fight? Why were you in a fist fight? 
Was it just two blobs of matter bumping into each other and swinging and, and that's why you fought? Or was there a reason? Was there anger involved? Was there fear involved? Was there love of money involved? And on and on I can go. But all of those things, I can't package a box of fear and hand it to you. It was cosmic. It was a spiritual thing. And so if we could track with that, if you believe that, again, this is the word of God, this is the authority from which I speak, then everything else is going to change. Everything else that you understand about the way I'm going to discuss is different. It has to be. Because it's spiritual and not physical. Now, I think um, I'm not here to disagree with anything that Tim said. I think it's great, and I think that God is sovereign, and he gave us science. He gave us medicine. He gave us doctors. He gave us these things. But I also believe that the brain is designed to serve the soul. The brain is designed to serve the soul, and if it's the other way around, I think we die a thousand intellectual deaths with no absolute standard of truth. And so everything he said is accurate, and I'm not here to dispute that. But one of the things that, oh man, doing this for 10 years, and I'm trying not to be controversial, but you have to understand serving in a faith-based facility for 10 years, we are looked at as secondary and not primary. And a part of the reason I think he adjusts, addressed why there's an issue with Christians or people calling it a disease, and he answered that well, and I agree with what he said. But another reason is this. There's ditches that people fall into, right? You, a lot of times we just, we, we should be in the middle of the road. Hey, we don't need to be extreme in this ditch, and we don't need to be extreme in this ditch. And what I've noticed in the secular world is a ditch of this disease and, and not allowing a Christian or someone from a faith-based facility to say what it is, to call addiction what it is biblically. And the Bible's clear about drunkenness. The Bible's clear about having a sound mind, a sober mind. Be alert. Be sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour, looking for someone to devour. And a roaring lion is not a surprise. You don't walk around and stumble upon a roaring lion. A roaring lion is loud. You could hear the roar of a lion for miles. I imagine. I've never, never been to Africa. But if I heard the roar of a lion, I'm not investigating. I'm running. And so what does that mean? The Bible talks about these things. And it calls it sin. Why is that important? It's important because how did any of us that are believers, how did any of us that are born again, get saved. And a lot of you, I surrendered my life to Christ. I did it. That's true. But what happened before that is the spirit of a holy God convicted you of something. It was of your heart of stone. It was of your sin. Convicted you of your sin and you repented to God and you saw the beauty and the majesty of who he is for the first time and you surrendered your life to him. What if we take away that conviction, which I'm telling you, not Tim, not a lot of people, but there is this in the secular world. What if it's taken away and say, you can't call that sin. You can't call that idolatry. Exchanging the glory of God and his promises for cheap substitutes. Sounds like idolatry. And if you can't call it that, and I just said, how do we get saved? It's this conviction of sin, and then there's this clash. And that's why we're careful to correctly identify what the disease is. And that it's curable. And that who the Son sets free is free indeed. And that if you're in Christ, you are new. And it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And it's no longer I. Mm. No, I, didn't, I didn't come here to preach at Wallace Memorial. Let me keep going. It's this, this conviction is important from a biblical worldview, from a biblical stance of addiction. It has to be important to be able to call it what it is. 
And I don't, again, I don't say that because I've gone to school and done all these things. I say that because I lived a life of addiction. My parents will tell you that it's, it was sin. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll happily tell you that. So I say that from that perspective as well. Think of the harm if we are pulling away that conviction. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1 through 3. <laughs> and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of of wrath like the rest of mankind. Welcome to my talk. You're all children of wrath. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. Man, when I was asked to, to give this biblically, I think that we needed to include this because it's true according to the word of God. We, we heard of these desires, and I'll discuss that later. Man, it's so true. There's no words that I could put to that desire. But I think it's also important to understand, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, and I think it's important to understand the context of this. The general context of this, because I was, I was told there's going to be a variety of people in the room. And some might not be believers, some may be, some maybe struggled with addiction, some maybe not. Some church folk, some not. And so I don't think... Discussing scripture without the context is wise. So here is the general context. Buckle in. If you've heard this a thousand times, if you grew up, if you were born in the pews, I really ask that you dial in and you have ears to hear and listen. And if you weren't, what do you have to lose by listening? Here's the context of that scripture that Paul just wrote to the church in Ephesus saying that they were dead and they were children of wrath. You ready? In the beginning, God created all things. He spoke them into existence. And his greatest of creation was human beings. How do we know that? Because he made human beings in his image, the Imago Dei. The image of God. And when he did this, all things were perfect. We were in perfect unity with our creator. There was no sin. There was no disease. There was no divorce. There was no pain. There was no evil. We were in perfect unity with God. And then that creation, you and I, we stopped wanting to be like God and we wanted to be Him. That again is idolatry. Now, before we can get mad at Adam and Eve, we've all taken place in this. I've never actively said I wanted to be God. I've never actively thought about being a God. But if you play the tape back and look at my actions, I'm serving Adam. Always. Look at my actions. I was serving me. And God is just. He's right always. And he's holy and he's pure. And I couldn't serve a God that wasn't. Even a little bit. After I thought about this. But because of God being just, right, and holy. There is wrath that is poured out upon sin. Because when they stopped wanting to be like God. And they wanted to be him. That's called the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Sin entered this perfection, which is the blame for everything, every stronghold, every disease, every hurt, every pain that we are experiencing. We are no longer in that perfect unity with God. And not only that, if you're actively participating in it, there is a wrath that is poured out. And this seems, to someone maybe hearing this for the first time, it seems harsh. You can logically understand how the, the Taliban raping the four-year-old deserves this wrath of God. But for the 
the man that lied to his parents. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense until you understand that God is sovereign and he is perfect and he is pure and any sin, any wickedness, anything but perfection, it's, his word says, be perfect. Your father in heaven is perfect. You must be perfect. And this is again, I'm sorry to start this in a, in a way that seems so bad. But what I've got to tell you, like I said, from my authority, this whole book is pointing to a savior. That's why the gospel is called good news. All of these things I described is bad, but if you go through this word and you understand spiritually, if you understand biblically what's going on, the, the story of God reconciling people to himself, it's good news. You see it even right there in Genesis chapter 3, we hear the first gospel preached. It's called the proto evangelum if you'll remember, it says the seed of woman, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. The first gospel preached even right there at the fall. You move along and you see the, the Egyptian, you've heard of, of Moses parting the Red Sea. Everybody, hopefully. If not, you've seen some Hollywood movies that depict it, right? Well, that's in the Bible. And that was the, the, based on 10 plagues that rained down over Egypt, which was the most powerful place on the planet that was enslaving the people of God. Moses, the stutterer, non-leader, unlikely candidate who's been on the run and hiding for 40 years, God tells him to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. 10 plagues come in. Of the last of the plagues, God commands that he is going to kill the firstborn of all families unless... There is blood of a spotless lamb covering your house, and that angel of death, death will pass over you. This is pointing to a savior. This is pointing to a, a, a sacrificial blood atonement of a spotless lamb. You move on, and this is where I think it's going to hem up some people, and move on to these pictures of a savior. We see the Ten Commandments. And I've I've heard this and a friend said that I could steal it from him, but I really want us to take a Ten Commandment pop quiz just so you don't think I'm picking on people who struggled with addiction. That if you're in sound of my voice, you're in trouble too, unless the Savior comes. This Ten Commandment pop quiz, not do you know them, but let's just name a few. Have you ever lied? If you said no, you're a liar. <laughs> Have you ever stole? Maybe not. How about this one? Have you always perfectly honored your father and mother? Mm. Maybe some conviction coming in. But there's also this point. There's also this. I try to get sneaky and I try to do this at times. Well, hey, I never cheated on my wife. I'm not an adulterer. Well, what does Jesus say? He ups the ante and says, if you've ever had lust in your heart, you are an adulterer. Well, I've never murdered anyone. Jesus ups the ante there too. If you have anger in your heart towards your brother, you are a murderer. And here's the thing. These are not supreme ethics. The Ten Commandments are not so high standard that only the best philosophical minds on the planet can understand them. Because if we go down to the preschooler rooms in this church, they'll have them on the wall. And yet, if you don't get a perfect 10 out of 10 your entire life, the wrath of God is waiting for you. Unless there's a Savior. Unless there is someone to take this wrath. I'm getting to something here. Sounds like really bad news. You keep going all throughout the Old Testament and then the New Testament. And you see, I talked about the Egyptian, the Lamb of God. And we see in the New Testament, this man called John the Baptist. He's baptizing people. And then there's this Jesus. Walk in and John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, the Son of God. Because the standard that God placed on us was too much that we could not bear it, we could not be perfect, we could not keep even those simple Ten Commandments. Since we could not bear that, 
And no one could meet that standard of perfection that God places. He enters into his own creation as the son, as Jesus, and he lives perfect. Perfect. For 33 and a half years, he does keep those Ten Commandments perfectly. He does live the life that is required by God to be in perfect unity with God perfectly. And then he willingly goes to the cross, which was a form of torture, which the, it, was a, it was invented by the Romans. And if you were a Roman citizen, it was considered too cruel to even be crucified. He was beaten, spit on, crucified, and he died. His heart stopped. Three days later, as the Bible proclaims, he conquered death and rose from the grave. And here's the message of the gospel, that if you put your faith and your trust and you surrender your life to him, when you hear the beckoning call of the Spirit, the conviction of the Spirit, if you surrender to this Messiah, this Savior, then you are now seen as perfect spotless, blameless, and the Bible calls you a saint. Who am I to say anything different? Which is why I did not introduce myself as Adam and I'm an addict. I'm a bloodstained child of the kingdom. I'm a saint. On the cross, the final words that Jesus said is, it is finished. Well, what is finished, Adam? He crushed his head. Crushed it. What does all this mean about addiction? Why is this important? As we go back to our scripture, as I said, the Apostle Paul writing to this church in Ephesus, he just told him all of that bad news that I just told you. You're dead in your trespasses. You have this wicked desire. You're by nature, you're children of wrath. And here's the next Verse And it's the two, oh, it's to maybe the two sweetest words in the Bible. And it says, you're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing it is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works for which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them I don't know how much time. What's my time frame? What's my stop point? Oh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Man, that's, that is the point. That is why understanding idolatry. When I choose me or I choose something this big and follow it, absolutely it causes things to happen in the brain. 100%. 100%. But I can't escape from saying that it's idolatry. I can't escape from saying that not being sober-minded or being drunkard is a sin because that's what the Word of God says. But it doesn't leave us there. It says that we have a Savior that entered into this place. Not only did He enter into this place, but before that, He spoke you into existence. He made you in His image. There's a fall that happened in Genesis 3 that all of this wicked came into play. And when I find myself years upon years and I've lost everything... A little of my story, I lost everything, I already told you. I mean, literally, my wife had left me. She separated from me. All of our savings, all of our bank accounts gone. Nowhere to lay my head. Had stolen from anyone that could trust me. And my parents, being the loving parents that they are, they would allow me to sleep in their house at night but they would lock me out come day. Adam, it's time for work. You got to go. And that used to make me angry, but how silly is that? 
They would lock me out because if they didn't, I'd steal from them. That's logic. I went to thousands of meetings and proclaimed that I was an addict. I went to rehabs. And it wasn't until I went to a Christ Center rehab, as Sarah said, called S2L, that I heard the truth. And guys, I grew up in church. I'm not trying to, I had a great upbringing and I had parents who loved me. But for some reason, when I went to this place, it was around Easter time, and I heard this message of the gospel. And I saw for the first time this death that was my death. And the life and the righteousness that now is my life and righteousness, that Holy Spirit conviction came. And I'm telling you, it crushed me. It broke me. And you know what's interesting? That was the most beautiful day in my life. I did not allow that conviction to be depression. I did not allow that conviction to be rolled in on me and woe is me and I'm never going to do this. It broke me in the most beautiful way because I saw God in a way that I never have. Not just as my get out of judgment thing, but it was more of a relationship thing. And it was so beautiful and I desired to learn more and I desired to grow in these things and I advanced completed months at this program. They wanted me to intern. I was like, okay, but this program's in Middle Tennessee. I'll intern, but after that, I gotta go my parents, my wife's back in East Tennessee. Any opportunity for a career is gonna be in East Tennessee. So don't ask them anything after internship. Well, they did. Hey, will you please consider and come on board being a staff member and making $50 a week? <laughs> okay, I'll give them the church answer. Let me call my wife. We're going to pray about it. We're going to pray about it. We'll give you three days, and we'll tell you, I'll tell you my answer. Well, on the second day of praying, my wife is at her desk, and her boss comes to her here in Knoxville and offers her a promotion, potentially a promotion, but she had to be willing to move to Middle Tennessee to take it. She's like, really, God? Okay. I'm hard-headed, but come on <laughs> And so there was this call, there was this moment that my wife moved there, we now have two beautiful kids. And God saved me from myself. God saved me from my sin. It doesn't mean that it didn't exist, it doesn't mean that the damage that I caused, it didn't mean I, had to, I didn't have to face consequences of the life and the seeds that I sowed. It meant now, in the eyes of the only one that matters, I'm seen as a saint. And I strive to want to know what that meant. I strive to walk towards that. I hated my sin because it was a re rebellion against my creator. And I hated it now. It didn't mean that it was easy. It didn't mean that I didn't have these thoughts. It meant now that I'm not going to be, I'm going to repent. God, I trust in your promises. I trust that when you say that I'm in you, that I'm made new, God, I don't feel new. Walk with me. Help me. It meant that I turned to him instead of some substance that I always have known and will always know is bootleg and always lies and have empty promises of deliverance. Very temporary, but it always ends badly. It wasn't hitting some kind of rock bottom. It was I wanted to be close and tied into a holy God who says that I'm now grafted in and adopted into his family and I wanted to walk that out I understood that it wasn't drugs and alcohol that was wrong with me it was drugs and alcohol were a symptom of a larger problem and like I said I was, a, I was in rebellion against my creator I was and unless I could tell people that unless I could be honest with myself about that I don't think I'd be standing here today free. There's a difference between being sober and being free. Being sober, and my, this is my definition, not Webster's. But my definition of being sober is I'm not doing something that I really want to do because of the consequences. Don't do it. You know, with the jail, 
You don't want to go to rehab again. You don't want your family to leave. You don't want your kids to da 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 That's sobriety to me. Freedom is, I don't want to do it anymore. My mind has been renewed. I don't want to do it anymore. It's not that I want to and I just can't because of consequences. It's, man, I have no desire to do that anymore. That's what freedom is. And that desire, as Tim talked about, man, he did a beautiful job of explaining that. But if you haven't struggled with addiction, and even if you have, you've probably tasted some of this. But if you haven't, I can't, I can't bring in English words to explain to you this desire. That's why you read the stories of his example. You read the stories of kids being in left and back seats. You read the crazy things that are good people. If you talk to their family, these are good people. But doing things for a desire, and it's very real, and we must address it. And I'm charged with biblically addressing it. And does the Bible address it? And it does. Let's see what it says about these desires. Because we just heard an Ephesian that talked about, hey, you're in your inner sin. You're going after your flesh and these desires. But here's 2 Peter. And it's chapter 1. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. The word of God. I'm going to grab a mic. Just drop it. Just throw it. If I had to take this off and punt it, I'm done. The Word of God just said that we can escape these desires. And remember I already said, addiction is not a surprise to God. God knows this desire. We can escape the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. God said it, so be it. Speaking to the church, the men and women of God, it, I think everyone will agree, even if they don't fully understand what it means, but even if you go to the 12 steps or the meetings, it talks about having a spiritual awakening, right? You'll hear when you see the trailer for the documentary, you'll hear your mayor, Knox County Mayor, talk about he believes that addiction is spiritual. Church, mighty men and women of God, why are we giving up authority over spiritual things? Why? And an honest answer would be, I'm scared. I'm scared that I might say the wrong thing and someone might die. And that's true. But I do have the numbers from last year. And in 2019, it went from 70 in 2020. Early estimations, it's at 93,000 in drug overdose deaths. That's a 30% rise. Church, they are dying. Silence is deadly. This is a spiritual situation, and you could speak into it. You don't have to know exactly what they're going through, but you can disciple, you could walk in, you could pray, you could proclaim the truths of God into their life. That is your authority. Reclaim it. Reclaim it. Be bold. Open up your doors. Get into the, get into the pit. That's church history. Look at all the hospital names. The church has always been the one that marches into the storm. Always in church history. Never retreating. We don't need to hand this off to the secular world. I say that and I preface this if I didn't. That doesn't mean that you exclude medical and clinicians and nurses and doctors and medication to a degree. That doesn't mean being a Christian that you exclude those things. That means that God's sovereign over those things and they come in underneath it. If it aligns with God's word, you use those things. We do it as to well. We have a doctor on staff. We have multiple clinicians on staff. We have nurses on staff. But you know what they all have? They all have a biblical worldview. 
And when they see someone, they know that that person, regardless if they're a believer, they're made in the image of God. So they have intrinsic value. And I'm going to treat them as though they do. Which means sometimes I'm going to tell them the truth and show compassion, even if the truth is something that's not popular. The, la- the verse goes on and talks about here's how you come out of these sinful desires. In verse 5, it says, For this very reason, what reason? Well, that you can escape the corruption that's in the world. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self control, and self control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail or fall. Getting help is important. Going and getting help is important for your loved one. Make it as hard as possible for your loved one to stay in a life of addiction and as easy as possible for them to walk into a a place of recovery. Because they've got to grow in these things. Because honestly, when I first went to S2L, this, this virtue or goodness, some versions might say goodness, I didn't know what was good. You wanted me to supplement my faith, add to my faith, grow in virtue, grow in goodness. I don't know what is good. I'm here. You grow in these things. You have mentors to speak into people's life. Well, what is good? God is good. He's the standard of what is good. His word is the absolute standard of truth. These are ways to grow. And here's another, uh, just a quick story, and I'm, I'm done, because I know we're probably hungry. I'm a pastor, so I've got four more closings that I'll do after this. <laughs> please, please, church, both sides, someone that's coming out of an addiction is scared to go to church, and then church people hear this. My wife, as you, as you heard the story, she moved to Middle Tennessee, and we knew no one. Um... And we knew it was important to plug into a church. Uh, I was at that time, I was working every other Sunday for the ministry. And one Sunday that I wasn't at a church that we found, and it was awesome. We both agreed this is the place that God has us. One Sunday, they were doing a small group festival. Small groups, join small groups. And I say this sarcastically because my wife took it upon herself to sign us up for a small group. (laughs) And I'm still young in my faith at this time. And she comes and tells me that, hey, we've got the next Sunday that you're off. We're going to go to these people's house that you've never met. We're going to have small group. And in my mind, I had a personal opinion of what a church people were. And I don't know, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't positive. You know, I was was a sports guy, you know, I'm popular. Obviously, I'm not athletic anymore. Um, But I didn't want to go, especially as my, that was a day off. I want to go to church and worship with you, but I just want to rest. You're talking to me after church. I've got to go eat and then go to these people's house. So we're about 10 minutes late, pulling up to this stranger's home. And, all right, Katie's my wife's name. Let's just catch it next time. You know, two weeks from now, it's awkward, we're new, we don't want to be late. And I told you she was a godly woman. She reminded me, well, we're in a church. She, she said, hey, get in there, let's go. She goes, I know you wear the pants, but let's go. I was like, yes, ma'am, I understand. Walked into this place, but I had a haughty spirit. I was like, I want to show her. I'll go, but I'll show her. And when I walked in, it literally seemed like little, leave, it, leave it to Beaver. Going around the room, hey, guys, da-da-da, introduce yourself. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm the whoever, and hey, hey, doing great. It went around the room, and it finally got to the comers. And this was my moment. This was my moment. I'm going to show her. Hey, guys, I'm Adam. I just got out of rehab a little bit ago. I was 
really bad off on drugs and I stole a lot and did a whole bunch of things and God and their jaws were just dropping. <laughs> and what seemed like forever was probably three seconds, but it was just silence. When I, my wife was like, yeah, that's true. God's good. He saved us all good. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, and I'm just like, okay, we'll never be back here again. The jaws still on the floor and the leader of that small group broke the silence with, yes! Finally, someone gets real in this room. And it went back around. God's on a troop. It went back around, and porn was confessed. Divorce contemplation was confessed. Realness happened in that room. And none of these people ever battled with a chemical dependence. And to this day, they're our closest friends. I'm the godfather. I'm the godfather. <laughs> for one of their children, which is like, whoa, when you start signing paperwork and like, this is a 12 year old kid they adopted from Haiti and you start seeing all this like serious stuff that you're like responsible for, but then it hits you like, God saved you. They don't know you as that guy. They see you as the bloodstained child of the kingdom. They see you as a saint, Adam. They want you to raise their child if something happens to them. We go on vacations with this group. So I encourage you. I say this just to encourage you. Get plugged in. It's important. Get plugged in. It's important if, if you're coming out of a, a rehab or something like that. And then I tell you this, church. Have boundaries. Don't set yourself up to be manipulated or taken advantage of. But dive into the pit. The water's warm. Get in there. That's what the church is. That's what God's called us to do. And I can tell you, after a decade of serving and seeing thousands of men, it is the most rewarding ministry there is. Because I see men come to me in the darkest seasons of their life. And when you see the lights click on and the Spirit of God begin to move, and you were a vessel for that, man, you can run to a brick wall if you wanted to. Well, probably not, but you think you could. But that doesn't mean that it's not also the hardest ministry that you'll ever do. I go to work every day expecting to be lied to. I go to work knowing that, hey, with darkness comes spiritual heaviness. Comes spiritual attack. Come all of this stuff from the past. So, hey, armor up. Know that this is a spiritual war, that God's called his people to engage in it. And here's what I'll leave you with on my final closing. I honestly believe this. From the rooms of recovery, the revival of a nation. And this nation needs revival. From the rooms of recovery will spark a revival in this nation. And it can't be done without the people of God and churches walking beside them. And you know why? because I've gone through so much, I don't give a rip what people think about me. I'm all in for God. If you look in this book, The Heroes of Our Faith, it's very important that God shows us that they were flawed humans. Will you join us? Will you walk with us? Will you, will you understand biblically that addiction is the same as, as the liar and the adulterer and the thief, but our, the consequences of our stuff is a lot more prevalent, but the answer is the same. The Sermon on the Mount, he didn't divide them out. The answer is the same. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live to him who saved me.